Well, as I hope to convey to you in what you talked about, and then you'll have an opportunity as well to attempt to troubleshoot a case study yourself in the tutorial on Monday. So this is a fundamental skill that we, we have, actually. You probably don't realize it, but over your four or five years here at Mac, you've already developed the skill substantially. It's, it is, in fact, what engineering is primarily about, is problem solving and troubleshooting. That's what we are very good at. Even if you don't work in a career afterwards that is chemical engineering, you will be using these skills. Uh, colleagues that I graduated with uh, work in finance or energy or, or um, some of these consulting companies, not as chemical engineers, but they use these troubleshooting skills and problem solving skills every day. So you are aware of this. We just want to make it a bit more formal and take a look at how it's applied to troubleshooting chemical processes. So here's an example. The yield of a valuable product is decreased in this flow sheet. This flow sheet from Fogler. So we have a reactor in the center here that's the part of the process, a recycle stream coming back from a separation unit. So the overall yield is decreased by 10%. Fix the problem. That's a standard, a standard uh, job that you have to do. So opportunity, challenge, or crisis. We're going to look at some very natural reactions that we have. Right now, you might just guess what's, what's going wrong. Um, you, you don't know where to start looking in that complexity. Is there a systematic way to deal with this, with this issue here yeah. and or issues like this? Uh, so that's exactly what we're going to look at in the next few slides. Now, there's three, three parts that we will learn. The first is we need to have an attitude adjustment. The gut reaction that you have when you're faced with this emergency, fix that problem now that your boss is coming to you, is very, very confrontational, it's very stressful, and it can lead to a lot of negativity that prevents you from doing the problem and problem effectively. So we need to learn that there is a way to adjust our attitude to get, to get started. So there's this hump that we have to get over. Much in the same way that when you get that final exam handed to you in Iverwin, you get that tremendous rise of stress, that anxiety building up, and like, oh my god, I didn't study this, or what the heck is going on here, right? So you, that's a natural thing that we have to just get over. There's an attitude that you just have to say, I know this material, and I can solve this. Okay, so we have to get past that initial anxiety. So there's a lot of psychological studies that get done that clearly show what you expect is obvious. High anxiety leads to low performance. Okay? But there is an optimum. Some form of anxiety can be channeled and help you to solve the problem. We'll learn there's a systematic approach that you can follow. We'll, we'll use a six-stage approach. Now, there are many other approaches to solving problems that are widely published. Some people have a 10-step approach, an 8-step approach. We are going to be using Don Woods' approach, uh, which is broken down over six steps. So on that sheet in front of you, that case study, at the back are the six steps outlined. And we'll look at this in the class today. We'll cover steps 1, 2, and 3. And in the class tomorrow, we'll look at steps 4, 5, and 6. And then we'll also learn here that troubleshooting is bringing together all the knowledge that you've, you've seen throughout your career here at Mac. So you're going to start to apply all the principles you've learned from other courses and bring them together to solve this, solve this problem. Okay, and like I said, you do this every day. The printer's not working in, in, in 216 or 296, so you've got that report that you have to hand in right away. Or you're trying to make a dinner to impress your date, and that dish that you're trying to cook is just not working out. Whatever the case is, you've got problems that you've solved many times successfully. Okay, so you, when you do this, you back afterwards and look at how you've done it. That's the important part. The final step is to look back to see how did you solve that problem eventually. You'll see many of these steps we're looking at in today's class come through. Okay, so here's the six steps we're considering. Engage, to engage with your mind and your emotions. 
But then we'll define the problem and thirdly we'll explore the problem. So the, de the definition of what is the problem and exploring issues related to the problem. That step number three is the critical step. This is what we're going to focus on today a bit. Is exploring the problem. This is really where all the creativity as an engineer comes in. Diagnosing the problem and implementing a solution then of steps four and five and then to the final step six is a review. So the key issues here we'll look at after every step. So especially at step three, by the time you've reached that third step, things have changed a bit and maybe worthwhile to look back at um, step one. You may just need to get your emotions back in check again. You've kind of gone more and more anxious as you're going through this procedure as you realize I'm not seeing my way through this problem. So you may need to come back and just get your emotions in check again. And some issues related to the definition of the problem may have changed. Especially in a, in a real time troubleshooting case, you're in that control room with the operator solving the problem. A problem may have changed while you've been working at it. So the key issue here is that these are not, um, it's not just a linear process, it is very much a circular, circular type process where you, you can at any stage come back to another stage to, to go back through it. Now, as I said on this page that you've, your handout that you have, we've got a case study, case number 10, that we're going to consider today. We have other case studies here in front that you're going to look at in the tutorial on Monday. So, so that's, that's what, where we're heading with this. At the back of your sheet is what's on the screen at the moment. So the key is here, when we're going through the troubleshooting approach, we don't try to memorize step one is to engage, step two is to define the problem and so forth. What we're interested in is, is applying the method. So this worksheet that's in front of you, you'll work through this systematically in the tutorial. In practice, when you start to use this though, in a company or in your future career, you may not go through a written sheet like this, you will be doing this in your head. But it's certainly worthwhile for the first few times to to try it out on paper and, and see the, the approach step by step. So the tutorial on Monday will go as follows. There, it's a standard feature that we have at Mac for every student since the 1980s has done this in the 4 in course. And it's unique to this university. Um, uh, some other universities have, have adopted Don Woods' method here, but it's pretty unique to Mac. So this is Don Woods' illustration of what we'll be doing. Every one of you will play the three roles here on Monday. So we'll interchange roles. So you'll have a chance to be the troubleshooter, the chance to be the expert system, or the observer. Okay, so this is why it's absolutely critical that you show up on Monday. Because without any one of these, you'll be... Um, um, without any one of these steps, you'll, the, the, the triad doesn't work out. So please, please ensure that you are there, or let me know by tomorrow if you cannot make it so I can reassign the, the triad groups. <coughs> So let's take a look at what's happening here. The troubleshooter is receiving a sheet of paper exactly like the one you have in front of you. It outlines the problem that's currently being experienced in the process. So this is information on what the operators have told you, uh, any verb, uh, verbal information that you've heard, any visual information that has been seen related to the problem. This is what you as the engineer know. The expert system has this binder over here, for example. This binder contains the sheet that gives the, the problem, but also contains the truth of what has actually gone on, with a lot of detail on the physical principles behind the problem. So a very in-depth analysis of what that case study is. The person who's playing the role of the expert system is essentially the, the plants. Okay, they're the true system. And they're going to be interacting with the troubleshooter. The troubleshooter is going to ask for specific information, very specific information, and is talking out loud. And, and the key is here for the troubleshooter to successfully do this role is to talk out loud and verbalize everything that they're thinking. Their thought processes of what they're eliminating, what their hypothesis is, why they're eliminating that hypothesis. So that's what the role the troubleshooter must do. They will then request 
information from the plant. So what is the temperature on TC7 reading right now? They'll, they'll request that information, hand it to the expert system, and the expert system will respond with, with an answer. Okay, so this is why this binder is handed out this week for you as the expert system to read it through so you understand exactly what the plant is doing so that you can give correct answers to the troubleshooter. You're not leading the troubleshooter on, you're simply giving minimal information, the bare minimum information to what the troubleshooter is requesting, you, you go in and give it to, to them or both. And then the observer takes the role of tracking the six steps that we're going to learn about today. That's why the troubleshooter is verbalizing this out loud, because then the observer is going to say, well, the troubleshooter here is currently in phase one, or in phase two, or phase three, and is, is, is monitoring the progress of how the troubleshooter is solving the problem. And it's actually what you're going to be graded on. So the observer is essentially um, tracking and tracking that process. Then you'll alternate roles, and there'll be a different case study, because the, trouble, uh, the expert system, there'll be three different binders for, for the triad. And the two other people you'll be interacting with are two other people in the class that you've never interacted with before. So they're not from your group, they're non-group members. Okay. So that's, the, that's the, the step for Monday. So let's take a look at an example to, to get some, some practice with this. So here's the case study then in front of you. Case number 10. So we have a fire heater being fed from a tank plus to a pump with a flow measurement being controlled by it. Uh, flow measurements being measured, the temperature of the inlet to the fire heater, and then that material in the feed being heated up. The final temperature on the outlet, TC1, is measured. And we're controlling that using the flow rate of the fuel oil to the fire heater. That material is being heated and goes on to a packed bed reactor. After the re reactor, we measure its temperature, we measure its flow rate, we exchange some heat that's needed before sending it to product storage. It's a very linear system, okay, very sequential, no feedback, uh, so no, no recycle. Uh, to make the fire heater work, obviously we have the fuel oil that's the pump manipulated variable, flow rate of that, and then we have our air flow rate being fed by a compressor. So that's the setup. And in the instructions, these are printed on a sheet in front of you, but there's some information on the sheet over here that's not been given. I've highlighted it here. So you're in the, um, well, the, the let's take the first sentence. The market for your product has been increasing, so you've decided to increase the flow rate the throughput of this process. So this throughput, this flow through the fire heater, being heated, all these flow rates, you're just taking it from whatever the base case is and, and shifting it up to a higher level. In addition, the maintenance group is currently calibrating all flow meters this week. This is happening, work on the plant that's happening in, pro, in, the, in the same time. You happen to be in the control room to check up on this maintenance. Two technicians have been uh, have been working on this, they've completed two of the sensors and they've gone on break. The operator notices or tells you that the plant has changed feed tanks recently. By that we mean up here we have a second or third storage tank and we've switched from one tank to the other. So we've emptied one and we've now moved and, and started to feed material from a second tank. That's happened earlier on. One of the outside operators has reported an unusual smell around the feed pump. The control room operator asks for your assistance because she's noticing a trend in the figure that you have in front of you, so the bottom half of the page. It doesn't look normal to you either, and she believes that it's caused by improper behavior of the stack damper. Up here on the, on the furnace, that stack damper, she believes that the cause of these improper trends in the plot is due to that stack damper. We were troubleshooting in the university, now's your time to solve it. So every one of these case studies here in front of you, there's some imperative at the end that drives you to making this be a necessity to solve in a pretty short time period. It's product critical, safety critical, something is driving the need to solve this. That's why it's a problem. So 
let's take a look then at those trends. What the operator is concerned about is the temperature was steady and is now falling off. The things that, we, that have happened earlier on, and in your plot that you have, is the, the duration of about that distance is one minute. So you've gone and you've slowly been increasing the feed through this system. So the flow over there through the valve has been increasing. And we notice that upward trend and the corresponding jump is fuel flow. So to eat that extra feed, the fuel flow is responded. The temperature has stayed level. You made another change in the feed rate. Fuel flow has gone up and now temperature is starting to drop off. Initial thoughts, what are you going to do? Decrease the feed rate. Is it first thing Decrease the feed rate. So, anything else? What's gone wrong? What, what would you do if you're there in the control room with the operator? going up with the half down. Which one? <laughs> you have manual control to do that. You've got a manual control, uh, the feed rate check, the valve and the feed rate. So there's a lot of gut feel that you start to, to get an issue. Okay, so and it, it can be pretty stressful. So this one might not be so stressful, but some of the situations um, that are in the binders and the situations that you'll deal with are temperatures that are rising and are reaching critical safety limits. Um, so it can be phenomenally stressful to, to deal with this and to get your emotions in check. So especially when you've got this urgency, what's the problem? And, and you've got either your manager coming at, at you, there's this, this, this urgency. So immediately people come to conclusions. They say, this is the problem. The pump is inhabitated, or the reactor is weak. Um, <laughs> okay, so, so, this, so the, the key issue is, at this point, is don't guess. Okay, it's very tempting to, to stand there and look at the flow sheet and just point to different parts of it and say, well, it's that valve's problem. Well, there's a leak in my a leak in my um, pipe in the tubing in the, in the reactor in the fire or something just to come up with ideas that may not make sense, okay, and or seem to be sensible but are just your gut reaction. So the the key is here is to simply stop. Don't guess. We're going to look now at a systematic method in, in the next two steps that get us going and then we'll start to tend to solve the problem in the, in the next step. Now, it is likely that you can guess the answer right away. In, in simple troubleshooting problems, in simple cases, it's, it's straightforward to guess what the answer is, especially with experience. For those of you that have had co-op terms or um, have had experience with similar systems, it's, it's quite easy to come to a conclusion right away. And certainly an experienced engineer would, would tend to get the answers much, much sooner. But there is a systematic procedure to go through this if you haven't been uh, trained. So here's some things that are not helpful. Is to have people around you shouting and add to the stress, why haven't you done something? Or for yourself to think that. Why, why, haven't, why hasn't the operator done something? Like why, why is the operator just looking at the trends? Why hasn't she started to do anything? Uh, so to try and, and take the further blame away from, from, um, from someone else. Uh, just blocking up and saying, well, I don't understand. I really am not, uh, this is not my area. Or you just add to that stress. Or running away, um, that has happened. And then, oh yeah. Every, look at every ocean liner that's crashed. You'll see the first people that are at shore was the crew. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's some, there's some yeah, okay. so, uh, one in South Africa where the, the, the pilot of the, well, I don't know, what do you call it, the captain of the ship was in, had checked into the hotel while the ship was still 
above the water. And the passengers were still on it. So, <laughs> so don't, don't, these are unhelpful as chess. Okay? What is helpful is to say, let's take a, let's just think about this logic. Okay? Listen to the people around you, listen to the operators, especially the operators. Okay, their opinions do matter. We will we'll see later on that you must listen to uh, other people's uh, opinions, but it's not that you need to accept that as the truth. Okay? You certainly take that into account. We work with the people around us to solve the problems and learn that using a systematic approach is helpful, despite it might seem long-winded initially to say, well, I don't want to go out and write a whole page of stuff out yet, hypothesis and proof and disprove things. But you will eventually learn to do this in your head very rapidly. So at least initially, let, let us follow a systematic approach. And then here is a slogan that you might see if you look back at some previous years ago cool. in material. I want to and I can. So uh, Dr. Marlin always prints this on the four N exams, right at the top in big bold, because at the end an exam is a troubleshooting exercise. So have this attitude that you want to solve the problem and that you recognize you are capable. You're not in this class because you're stupid. Okay, you're here because you have successfully learned the material from all the previous years. You have the capability to solve this problem. You may not want to, but you're in a position where you want to keep getting that salary if you want to. Okay, so, um, that, and that's the reason why we are employed as engineers, right? If, if the problems were all easy, uh, we wouldn't be paying, being earning the, the, the money we are earning and being in the position we are in. So here I thought just to take a look at this as an alternative way to think of stress management. Uh, there are some careers that are far more stressful than ours, despite what we sometimes think at the moment with all our projects due at the same time. Here's one that I actually thought of doing this when I was in high school, but then they took us on a tour of the air traffic control center in the city. I left in a like, no way. These people are, um, are something else. So, I'll show you a quick video on this. I want you to think also what we can learn about this. We can learn about this as engineers quite, quite a lot. But back to the video that I'm about to show you, the TCAS system, just a second here, TCAS is the Traffic Collision Avoidance System. It's a system that was developed and is installed in the cockpit of the aircraft and it, it uses uh, monitoring tools to tell the pilot what the traffic control, what the traffic is within about a 40 second radius around the aircraft. And it will then immediately tell the pilot to take avoiding action and it's coordinated. So the one aircraft will go up and the other will go down to avoid a mid-air collision. So after a successful number of mid-air collisions, this system is now mandatory in all uh, commercial aircraft. So here's a video that talk, shows a bit about what happens with the interaction with an automated system that's telling the pilots what to do and then the air traffic controller on the ground telling the pilots something else. So let's take a look at this. Um, I'm hoping I can get it sufficiently. So this is, uh, there's quite in some areas of the uh, Let's just listen carefully. <coughs> So I climbed the EC9 to 4,000 feet. The jet stream was already at four. 
When I realized that they were going to converge at 4,000, I asked the DC-9 to go back to Alpha 3, and I asked the jet stream to go to 5, and try to turn them both. And then their TCAS gave um, conflicting information and told the jet stream to descend and the DC-9 to climb. to our own operation as chemical engineers. One is I'm always surprised by how much um, authority and leeway we give our operators with very little training. Okay, so air traffic controls are phenomenally well trained. Um, and you go through multiple simulations and scenarios and are, are incredibly well trained. We do not do the same in the engineering field. We often have people just work behind the desk as an operator and learn on the, on the, online with a real running system uh, with very little training. An operator will almost never have a university education. Not to, to put them down, they're incredibly skilled at what they do, but inevitably the people in that role are not people who, who are university educated because they usually like to be challenged if you're university educated you move into other areas of the company. So we put a lot of a lot of ability, or, uh, given a lot of control of the process, with very little training, not nearly as much training as we see here. But something else that surprised me was the phenomenal levelness of her voice during that very critical period. She kept calm and she handled it. If you listen to on YouTube, there's a number of other air traffic control videos of things going wrong, and um, even when there's been accidents, they're phenomenally calm before and after it. So there's no emotion in their voice. It kind of seems a little bit psychopathic, but it needs to be that way to, to manage the stress. So this is, the, this is what we mean by the engaged part, is that's keep calm and just keep going. Okay? Um, you've, got to, you've got to work through the situation and realize that you can do it. Okay? There's no point in to get that heightened stress and that agitation in your voice because that doesn't do anything uh, to help solve the problem with the people around you. We also have to recognize that there's some time critical behavior um, or some time critical problems. We tend to rank our, uh, them into three levels, high, medium, and low. And high critical problems, these are when you've got seconds or minutes left to solve the issue before it gets serious. And if the safety interlock system has not already been initiated, this is the problem type of problem where you do initiate it. Bearing in mind that initiating SIS tends to be incredibly aggressive on many processes and can actually damage the equipment and lead to a lot of financial um, delays and time to get the process up and running. However, if it's called for, that's, that's what is needed. A medium type of critical problem is intermediate between the low, low criticality, obviously we'll, we'll talk about in a minute. Here, this new 
new-ish idea of moving processes to what's called a safe park zone. So from a hands interoperability study, or from careful thinking about the processes, many engineers are starting to identify the safe park point for their processes. So these are points where you can move the process to, which is definitely not economically optimal. You're not using good product, if any product, at the, at the safe park zone. But it's essentially a point that you can have the operators trained, that they can revert to, that you know will lead to, uh, definitely not economically optimal, but will lead to something that's in between doing nothing and being very aggressive and turning the whole plant off. So a safe park in generally involves moving to lower temperatures, reducing the throughput down to a lower, lower scale, say 50% or 25%. You go back to a last known good operating point. So for example, in this um, case study we're looking at right now, where we've gone and increased the flow steadily, as Matt suggested, let's move back down to that low flow rate. So let's go back down to that last good operating point for increased cooling to uh, any systems that, that are um, generally heated. Or if there's low, low criticality, by this you, we mean that you've got pretty much hours or sometimes even months to solve this problem. So this is just one of these nagging problems that is leading to poor efficiency or reduced economics on your process. It's not going to be time critical. Uh, you do have to solve the problem, however. It's not just going to go away by itself. But um, it, and it gives you time now to acquire resources. So you may be able to take a sample from the process and have the lab analyze it, or do some calculations on a spreadsheet or a simulator to verify that what you plan to do will actually work. Um, or it might require getting outside contractors in. If um, you've got some serious problems with the internals of a reactor, it might even go as far as having an outside company coming and do a radiological scan of that reactor. Essentially, it's like doing an x-ray on the reactor to see what's inside it without having to open it up. Those sort of things take days and weeks to, to organize and coordinate. So you can suffer that profitability loss and um, not get too drastic action. So that's generally how we rank, rank this. And so the level of action we take is in proportion to what that criticality is. So bear that in mind as we look at the next few slides. Okay, so the engaged step is managing your stress and recognizing that you can do this. Let's take a look at the defined stage. There's several ways that you can look at the defined stage. Um, a number of techniques. One on the back is to simply state as we turn over the page, let's, let's look at this, what should be happening and what is actually happening. So in this particular case, what should be happening? What we can fill in there on the top of the sheet in this area that says what should be happening. So over here, what should be happening in this process? understand that, that on the flow diagram on the first page, TC1, which is that temperature we're measuring, is under feedback control. There must be a set point for it. We'd like to be at set point. That's where we want to be. What is actually happening is that that temperature is below, below its set point. What does the fuel oil do? Fuel oil is rising. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if I'm putting in more fuel, I should get a lower temperature? That doesn't make sense. 
So because of the feedback control, I'm, I'm seeing this issue. Feedback control is saying my temperature is, is below a set point, and so it's opening up that fuel line to provide more fuel. So we should be controlling the temperature. What's actually happening is that the temperature is falling, however, the fuel is increasing. Um, to, to try and, and, and it's not seeming to work. So I can then state then in the next line on this page, it says, so what define therefore what the deviation is, but the temperature is below set point and my fuel flow is too high. So it's higher than I've seen it in the past. Okay, so what I'd like to do then is to achieve two states. One we call our initial state and one is our final state. So I'll just quickly change the slide and then I'll come back to that. So we've got our current state where we are. We'd like to look at two different states. Something to get to initially that's safe and easily achievable, and then the final state which is more efficient and going to work from a long-term perspective. So that initial state is get to safe operation rapidly, and then I'd like to eventually make sure that I'm producing the product with the correct specifications. That temperature that's dropping is now going into a reaction system, which is now reliant on that temperature. That's why we're controlling the temperature up here, in fact, is that temperature needs to be at a certain point to have that reactor running correctly. So the fact that I'm feeding material in there below temperature implies I'm producing all specification product. Notice that's not my concern right now, is the fact that I'm producing bad product. That's my ultimate goal, is to make sure I, I fix this up. But my initial goal is to just get this problem sorted out right now. That could be a safety issue. Because what you should be asking in your mind is where is all that fuel going? If that sensor is correct, that fuel sensor is correct, where the hell is that fuel? Okay, so that's the first the first in the defined step. One one approach is to look at where we are, where we should be, and then get a deviation from that. And then if we set our goal for ourselves, we would like to be immediately, and then another goal of where we'd like to be in the future, that gives us something to work for. So that's uh, one, one mechanism to use in the defined stage. Another is to look at, um, it's not here in the slides, but I'll just talk about it. You see on your, on your sheet in front of you, there's the when, where, who, and uh, extent and duration. So you can say, the problem is when. The problem is when I saw the second increase in feed rate. So this helps you set for yourself what, what's going on. The problem is not during normal operation. We didn't see this for this earlier part. So when I was running at my low feed rate, and even when I bumped up to a slightly higher feed rate, I didn't see a change in temperature. So it appears that my problem is not due to that. Where is my problem? My problem is around the fire heater. It's not around the packed bed reactor, it seems. It's definitely around the fire heater where those three variables that the operator is concerned about are occurring. So you can go through that table and, and help clarify the problem, which is what the, the fine stage is all about. To get it clear in your mind what it is that you're solving and what it is that you're not solving. So when you're doing this as the troubleshooter on Monday's tutorial, these are the things that you're verbalizing to the observer and to the expert system. So you're not, you could say this in your, in your head to yourself, and that would be fine, but what, what we're looking for is for you to verbalize this so that the observer can track your process for you. So the observer will essentially tracking over time. You've got 25 minutes to solve the case study on Monday. We'll be tracking how much time did you spend in the defined stage, how much time did you spend in the, um, in the next stage of exploring the problem. So you can see for yourself, because you can't keep track of it and, and solve the problem at the same time. It's helpful to see after the fact, okay, this is how I allocated my time in solving the problem. So please uh, make sure you verbalize this to, to your other two group members. Now let's take a look at the explore phase of it. Um, we probably won't have enough time to cover it all in today's class, but 
the we'll introduce the topic and anyway explore and plan take place iterative. I find that when I do this, I'm filling out the part of the exploring my problem up here where I'm thinking of the different mechanisms of the process, but I'm also filling out part four on planning. So if you take a look at your table at the bottom, it says what's your working hypothesis? For example, your working hypothesis might be temperature control of one is broken. That might be a working hypothesis. As we start to look at this explore phase, you might be coming up with hypotheses. So what I'd like you to do is even now while I go through this explore phase, if you think of something that might be the cause of this, this problem, write it down in your hypothesis section because uh, these thoughts tend to come very quickly to your mind and, and you can lose track of all the ideas that you potentially have. So while I do stage three, you also are planning your steps for stage four. So what the explore phase is about is the following, and this is really where, where um, I think the McMaster approach to troubleshooting is unique. You are thinking about what are the fundamentals in this process. What are the things you've learned about in chemical engineering that govern this process's operation? What are the first things that come to mind? Which topics would you want to draw on? Which textbooks would you look at if you wanted to get into depth of this problem? What are the fundamentals that apply here? Heat transfer, which section of heat transfer applies? Clearly we are, it is definitely heat transfer, it's temperature that's dropping. We've got a fire heater. What aspect of temperature, uh, sorry, of heat transfer is, is, is applicable here? We're burning a fuel. How is that fuel transferring its heat to the stream? Convection and radiation. So we've got our, that's when I say what are our fundamentals, that's what I'm after is, is this a mass and energy balance problem? Is this a recycle problem? Is my second law of thermodynamics going to be useful over here? Am I transferring all my heat into useful work? Is, it, is there something that's wrong in the stoichiometry of the process? So you, you need to start to pull in these concepts from your other forces. In this case, the radiation from the fuel to that pipes, those pipes in the heater, are going to be the fundamental equations that we're looking at. So we're looking at the temperature difference between the flame and the temperature difference in the, in, the, in the tubes. And we know that that's related to the flame temperature to the tower of four minus the tube temperature to the tower of four, then multiplied by the heat transfer area and the, and the heat transfer coefficient. So when we're talking fundamentals, think about that equation now for a minute. Okay, so this equation is UA T flame minus T tubes. So, we've got to consider that it is it my heat transfer coefficient, is it the area, is it the flame temperature, is it my tube temperature? This is the one that's dropping, which, this is my fundamental uh, equation governing the system. What are the other aspects that could be changing here? This might trigger you to come up with a hypothesis that you want to investigate in the next section of planning. What are the key variables involved? So we've identified some of the key variables here. Are there any other variables involved in the system? Well, there's the fuel flow rate. Or there's the feed flow rate. So the pressure in the boiler. Pressure in the boiler. Anything else? The air flow rate. Air flow rate. So those are, there's a number of variables right there that we can start to put on our list to investigate in the next section. What are the key variables involved? Could the normal variability in the process cause this behavior? So this is standard deviations that we expect while the process is operating. Would they lead to this sort of drop in temperature? Okay, in this case, it might be a little bit beyond our knowledge of what the process's normal variation is, but it's clearly an issue. If, I would say this is definitely beyond the normal variation because the operator is concerned about it and has brought it to our attention. 
but it is it's well beyond that. So what this comes down to is essentially is causality. What is the cause of the system? So let's just talk about this quickly uh, so we understand what we mean by causality. This is exactly the issue that doctors face. You go into a doctor, you go, oh my goodness, I've had this throbbing headache for a week. That's the symptom. But what's causing it? There could be so many different causes that lead to that same symptom. Okay, so we're used to this phenomenon of one symptom that we're observing having multiple potential root causes. Okay, so this is, this is exactly this. This is what our job is. We're essentially becoming a doctor for the process. There's this issue. Can we come back and uncover what that root cause is? An uh, another example that is more related to what our area is, for example, is the, the pressure at the top of the distillation column. So the top of my distillation column, I'm taking this material off, it comes to a condenser, and I keep some material back to the top of the column. This pressure over here is high. That's the <coughs> symptom. It's higher than normal. What, what could be potential causes in this case? So pressure, top column, there's my trays, there's my condenser, and I'm using cooling water. So cooling water duty is lower. What could cause cooling water to do that? So it's so, a so, so warmer cooling water than normal. Your tubes in your heat exchanger are fouled. Your cooling water flow rate is lower than normal. These valves that regulate the flow over here might be blocked or slower than normal. So there's a number of potential causes. These could be root causes. So cooling water temperature is too low. That's a root cause. Oh, so cooling water temperature is too high. That's causing insufficient cooling, which means that I'm not able to reduce my pressure. Flow rates are not what I want. I could even be as far foot, as far down as back here in my reboiler. I'm sending too much vapor back up. So it could be further away from where you even measure. So we're used to this as engineers that one symptom shows up as multiple root, multiple causes. So that's what we mean by causality and cause and effect. We're trying to go back to what the root cause is here. So in this case, I'll just wrap up with this and then I'll hand out the binders. What could cause the what could cause the temperature to drop on the outlet? Would the feed flow going up or the feed flow going down cause the temperature to drop? Feed flow going up. Feed temperature going down. So those would be potential causes. Uh, so what I'll do next class then is we'll look at some of the other potential causes and we'll move on to the manual. So uh,